the theory or the, the um, I guess we could call it the, the, guide, the model that we'll want to use is the sweet spot model. And the way we, want, we like to explain it is that if you're an organization of any kind, commercial, non-commercial, or you're a person, and you have X number of resources, that's always going to be your starting point. Any individual organization has finite resources. One of the main reasons to innovate is to increase those resources, that you'll, be, you'll thrive better. What are we going to do? So if you look historically, what companies have done in order to grow is that they started asking their customers, started asking the customers, listen, you know us. What else would you like from us? And what the research was showing is that you've been getting these near ideas, these ideas that help you expand your resource base, but they're really, really close in to your resources. A lot of times you'll get in voice of customer or marketing research uh, feedback that we want it bigger, we want it better, we want it stronger, we want it faster, we want it smaller. They're usually words that are in relation to aspects of your resources that they know today. It's just more of it or better of it. And these usually don't lead to the really innovative ideas. They just lead to small improvements or small uh, incremental innovations that you're able to come out with. Different people started realizing that that's not good enough, that you can't really get true innovation out of just asking uh, for voice of customer. And so they decided that what we need to do is create new processes, different ways to get you further out, to break through the er aspects of, uh, of innovation, the, the incremental aspects of expanding your resources. So what they did is they started developing processes, probably the most well-known process that has actually become somewhat of a generic term for idea generation is brainstorming. Brainstorming started emerging in different places with different people uh, at that time. Um, and they started developing a method of how we can make sure to break free of these er and to get to the really innovative products or really innovative ideas and whatever we're working to innovate. In brainstorming, we want a lot of ideas. Chances are, statistics, that if you have a lot of different ideas, you'll probably have some gems in there. You'll probably have some really good ideas uh, in there. Now, I, I wanted to show you um, that basically, because of these three rules uh, of brainstorming, what you find is that you're very successful in breaking free of the er ideas. However, what the research has shown in recent years is that usually in a brainstorming process you get a little bit too far. You get to some really silly, out there, wacky ideas. Uh, and I wanted to show you a, a quick film that you might be familiar with. It's a, it's a bu budget commercial. Um, I see some people smiling, so I guess some of you are familiar with it already. I think it demonstrates really well some of the rules that we've talked about about brainstorming. And what I want you to, to do is pay attention to the last line, the, the last sentence that they say during this commercial. Let's make the driving experience more enjoyable. We'll rent uh, Jaguars, town cars. And the Grand Marquis for $49. Oh, the cars will have uh, leather seats, a uh, CD player. And aromatherapy candles. Oh. We don't really need aromatherapy candles. Yes. Yeah. Maybe not the candles, but the enjoyable thing is good, yeah. you know? Uh so, they'll get off the bus, pick out the car they want, and be on their way in seconds. We'll call it Fast Break, our fastest way to rent a car. Can we get people from the airport to their car quicker? We can if we give everyone jet propulsion packs. I, I like the Fast Break idea. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, I like that one. Oh, okay. just go with that one. Wow. What has been found is that brainstorming has been very, very successful of breaking free of the er ideas. If you go through this process, you really accomplish breaking free of those close-in ideas. The problem is that you get so far out, like the aromatherapy and the jet propulsion pack, that you put down your idea list. What's on the idea list? Not the ridiculous ideas. You don't want him to laugh you out of the room. You know that it doesn't make any business sense. But what you're left with if you take out all the wacky ideas, are the near ideas. And what has been shown in the recent years is that although the brainstorming process 
has some great advantages in terms of team building and energizing and exercise of getting, getting groups to work together, it's not a really good tool for implementable innovation. Because at the end of the process, you come out with these really wacky ideas, these weird ideas that you're not even willing to show to a decision maker uh, to get approval, and then you're just left with these near-in ideas. So it's a great mental exercise, uh, and it has other advantages, but it, it's not really good for innovation. Assuming that that's true, all that research that's been happening, so the near ideas, just asking the, your customers what they want isn't good enough to get innovative solutions. Doing brainstorming processes aren't good enough for the purpose of innovation. What you need really is to find that sweet spot, that area that is between the near-in ideas and the far-out ideas that are innovative enough that they're not just er ideas, that they're not just improvements on what you have, but they're not so far out that you can't even imagine implementing them. And what the SAT method is about is uh, working with a series of principles and tools to help you make sure that you're always generating uh, innovative ideas within this sweet zone, within the sweet spot, uh, making sure that you don't get too far out and making sure that you don't stay too close in. Technical problem solving aspect is going to serve as a platform for learning uh, some of the crucial uh, principles of the method that help us make sure that we're always within the sweet zone when we're looking for solutions to tough problems. So the problem I wanted to start with is, is a case study that we we ran into about uh, 10 years ago, at least. Um, it was an issue with an antenna. Uh, a company had just won a tender, uh, a bid, for manufacturing antenna, antennae, for, uh, for a European country, a European military, in fact. Uh, and the goal of this European country was to be able to put these antenna slightly over the border to, in its surrounding, uh, surrounding countries. They're not really enemies, they were at peace, but they didn't want to take any risk. Uh, to just be able to make sure that there will be no mobilization of troops without them knowing. It was a, a cautious move. Uh, and in order to do so, they put out this bid uh, for companies that, that manufacture antennae. And they said that we're willing to work with the company that can provide us the cheapest option for these antennae, as long as it meets three conditions. The conditions are as follows. The first one is that um, only one soldier or one person is needed to go into the enemy territory to set it up. We don't want it to be so heavy and so bulky and so complicated that we need to send in a whole platoon or a whole squad of people uh, because that might uh, look fishy to our, uh, to our neighbors. So, it had to be light enough for one soldier. It also had to be maintenance free for at least three years, because we don't want to keep sending people in to, to fix whatever's wrong with it. So it has to have certain quality aspects of it. And the third one is that there's no downtime. We have to make sure that it's always transmitting and receiving uh, that way we're not missing anything. So not depending on time of year or weather or altitude or anything else, it always has to be transmitting and receiving. And the company that won this bid was able to do so because they were able to meet these three conditions and produce the cheapest option. It looked like it had a shaft, it had a cross beam, it had antenna mechanisms that were kind of circular, and it had a small battery here to, to give it enough power for that three years so that they wouldn't have to keep replacing. So it had a power source uh, for about three years. And that's, that's it. That's how they were able to make the cheapest, uh, the cheapest option. And they won the bid. Uh, and as they were doing, the, uh, they were doing the, the simulations to make sure that it's working, they found that it worked great, except in one condition. Because some of these antennae have to be placed on mountains, in mountainous regions, they didn't take into account that some of the year, or sometimes even many parts of the year, especially in Europe, there's snow that falls in the mountains. And what would happen is that the snow would fall and accumulate on the cross beam and the antenna parts. When that happened, the temperature was so cold that it would freeze, it would become hard and heavy. And because of that, the weight 
would make the cross beam break. Once the cross beam broke, it wasn't at the right height, it wasn't at the right functioning capacity uh, in order to be able to transmit and receive, and the whole thing uh, was terrible. Okay? So that's, that's their problem. Now they want to be able to still be able to keep that, uh, that bid, still keep the money, because governments pay pretty well uh, when, you win, when you win bids. Um, they want to keep it and solve the problem that they've encountered. So they still want to remain, retain the cheapest option uh, in solving this. Okay? Any questions about the situation? So we're going to try to solve it for them now. Now, just to combine some of your comments, we'll go through some of the, the theories. And there are what's called the four characteristics of an inventive solution. Uh, it sounds much more interesting <laughs> or, uh, or complex than it really is. But through research, there have been identified four characteristics of an inventive solution, which usually contribute to the inventiveness of the solution. Uh, the first one is called simplicity, it's something that uh, we haven't said. Simplicity says that the concept that underlies the solution is identical or very close to the most banal solution. It, in, uh, in clearer terms, it usually means that if you ask a child who never learned anything about engineering or physics or that specific problem, what should I do to solve the problem? It's something very close. The actual solution, the inventive solution, is very close to the answer that that, that child will give. In this case, usually they'll say strengthen the pole. Uh, they'll say somehow strengthen the pole, and now you have to find the ways to do it, and some of the other principles will help us find those ways, but uh, it usually means that that's the direction of the solution. Uh, for example, we were working with, with this company that makes scanners. Uh, anyone in the business of making scanners or electro-optic devices of some sort? The scanner, process, the scanner machine itself is a very, very simple machine. It has pretty much only three components. Uh, you put whatever the, the piece of paper that you're trying to scan on the glass. The light goes through that uh, piece of paper. It hits a mirror because otherwise the scanner would be a very weird shape. So it has to deflect the, the light information somehow. Hits the mirror, goes through a filter to clean out all the unnecessary information uh, that's in that uh, light. And it gets translated in the CCD into uh, electronic information. That's how, that's how a scanner works. Now, the company that we were working with uh, started to develop their next generation scanners. And they did something that I don't know if any of you do. They did what's called a pre-sell. As they were starting to develop it, or as they made a decision that they wanted to develop the next generation, they started selling it to their existing clients uh, in order to help finance the R&D investment. Any of you do that? Yeah. Um, so they put a price tag on it. They said, okay, this is what it's going to cost. If you order now, uh, when it's ready, you'll get it at that price. And they started developing it. And while they were developing it, they noticed that they made an error uh, in approximating the cost. And the error was that they forgot to account for the price of the filter. They priced everything great except for the filter. Uh, and the filter was a $100 component in a uh, about an $800 product, which would seriously cut into your profitability uh, if now you have to sell it at that same price uh, to those pre-orders um, and swallow a $100 uh, loss. So what does simplicity say? Yeah, make it without a filter. So don't use a filter, right? So simplicity says don't use a filter. Now, OK, it's, it's an interesting concept. But it doesn't give us the full solution, right? So let's not filter. Now we have to think about what are these elements that are there that are still around that can help us with the filtering uh, element. And what they came to realize again is that their, their mirror suppliers can make mirrors in any shape, any opacity, tinted, not tinted, and whatever. And mirrors have been known to do functions of filtering in certain cases. So all they did is they turned back to their supplier and they said, can you help us out by developing a mirror that actually filters away the information that filters would normally do? And actually, if you open up uh, any of the engineers there, if you remember Dilbert, uh, if you open up your scanners today, you'll see that no scanners nowadays have filters in them. Because they realize, because of this problem, that they never even really had to have a filter in the first place. It's just that the problem made them realize that filters were unnecessary, although they had assumed that it was an essential part. Because filtration is an essential uh, uh, quality or function that needs to happen, we assume that we have to have an element there that does the filtration. We can't just put it on other elements that, 
that we might be able to utilize. The second one is specificity. Specificity says that if you're looking at the problem, look at what's unique about the problem and not what's exactly the same about this problem versus other problems. So for example, if in our antenna, the problem wasn't that uh, snow fell on the crossbeam, but uh, we had uh, birds landing on the crossbeam too much, and that made it too heavy. Would our solution work? Probably not. Because the solution has to be tied in very specifically, or it's better uh, if it's tied in very specifically with, with the problem. Um, anyone here ever own a original Volkswagen Beetle? Okay, yes. Um, do you know how the uh, windshield wiper mechanism worked? We have, we have some, some head nodding. For those of you who didn't have the original Beetle, <coughs> there's a problem in the Beetle uh, that when uh, Volkswagen decided to go ahead and manufacture the car for the masses, the Volkswagen, the cheapest car available, the cheapest car possible, what they did, they made a lot of engineering changes to what a car would normally be. And one of the major changes that they did was they put the engine, instead of in the front of the, instead of in the front of the car, they moved it to the back, to the trunk area. And by doing so, they were able to propel the car, push the car, or then pull the car like a normal engine would do. Uh, and it was a very interesting, innovative design. Now, because of that, usually in cars today, the, the way cars work is that the, uh, the mechanism for spraying water onto the windshield to clean off your windshield, the windshield wiper fluid, is attached to the motor. So the motor gives some power, sprays, sprays the water, uh, and that's great. But in the Volkswagen Beetle, because the engine was in the back, they had to find a solution. Now, they could, of course, make a, uh, a wire that connects it all the way from the back to the front. Probably not the best idea. Probably would add some sort of cost or make it uh, somewhat dangerous. Um, but they found a very interesting and probably an innovative solution uh, to, doing, to doing that. So now, who knows what they did? Okay, so if the, if the engine's in the front, the trunk is in, if the engine's in the back, the trunk is in the front, and inside the trunk is a spare tire. Now, the spare tire has air pressure. So what they did is they simply connected a tube from the spare tire to the reservoir of the, of the windshield wiper fluid, and you press the button, it released a pss of the air, sprayed onto the windshield wiper, sprayed the windshield wiper fluid onto the windshield, and it was great. It, but what happens when you need your spare tire? <laughs> so, so, of course, those are going to be the comments that you get when you start thinking of the innovative solutions. Of course, the challenges start coming up really quickly. But one of the things you have to realize is that before you assume that you know what the results are going to be, start testing it. And what they realized is that it uses so little air pressure that the average use of windshield wiper fluid, you could go more than three years without having to refill the air of your spare tire, uh, and it really doesn't have any effect on its functionality. Uh, so it was the solution that they implemented in the end. Some of you may have experienced that it didn't work after a while because a lot of the mechanics didn't know of this solution. It was too specific to the Beetle and when you actually had to use the spare tire, get a new tire and the mechanics put it back, uh, put the spare tire back in the trunk, they forgot to reconnect the hose. That was the only reason why it didn't work uh, sometimes. But the idea was that <clears throat> this connection of the tube is very specific to what's unique about the Beetle versus what we have in other cars. So if we search other cars, other automobiles for this kind of solution, what do I do with uh, the windshield wiper fluid? It wouldn't have helped me there. I actually had to utilize the uniquenesses, the spare tire being in the front, in order to come up with the solution that's specific to the problem that I have. Um, before we move on, uh, I just wanted to to ask your help because, because uh, as Birgit mentioned, we travel the world. Um, I have a friend in the university system in Israel who is uh, doing some research, uh, biotech research, uh, and he feels that he's uh, found the vaccination, the, the vaccine inoculation for uh, the HIV virus. Uh, and he's done some tests on, on the rodents and the, he's gotten approval now in order to start on human beings and he's trying to collect uh, some volunteers that are willing to uh, that are willing to participate in this experiment. Well, basically what happens is that he'll inject you with just a little bit, a weakened version of HIV, uh, and that'll protect you and make sure that you never get uh, never get AIDS, that you never contract the disease. So anyone here, I mean we have a hundred people here, we gotta have some volunteers. No? No one. Um, 
That, that's, the, that's the idea behind the third uh, characteristic, which is called the problem is the solution. Uh, as you saw in the antenna, the ice uh, actually became the solution for the problem. Originally it was the problem, and now it's both the problem and the solution. Uh, you can think back to Jonas Salk trying to go through that same process and convincing uh, people that vaccinations really work. All you need to do is take a, a weakened version of this virus or bacteria or whatever it is, uh, and, and you'll be safe. Don't worry, never get polio. Never. Uh, and it's a very difficult way for people to process information. Human beings aren't willing to accept that a problem, that the actual problem could be part of the solution. But if you notice, some of the solutions to the biggest problems that are out there uh, are problem is the solution uh, solutions. So for example, you know how uh, forest rangers fight fires? They, 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 do, a, they do a burn. Uh, in front of the fire, in front of the path of the fire, so that it has no more fuel left. So they actually add fire to the, to the forest in order to actively prevent the larger fire to, to continue. Now, one of the more important and crucial uh, problems that you probably deal with is also an example of that. Um, we have some white tablecloths here. Uh, if you have some red wine spilling on your, on your white tablecloth, uh, what do you do to get rid of it? Sorry? Spill more and make it red. Spill more, spill more and make it red. That's an interesting solution. So it's not, you didn't solve the problem, but uh, you somehow overcome uh, other obstacles. Uh, you can pour white wine on it before it, uh, before it starts uh, setting. Uh, and the chemistry of the grapes uh, actually release the, the red stains from, uh, from the tablecloth. So there are lots of solutions. Some of them are more practical in our day-to-day -day lives. Some are less. Uh, but that's, that's an interesting problem is the solution uh, example where it's usually very difficult to think of how I can add more problem to the situation in order to find a solution, but it's a direction that you should definitely try to explore uh, if you're looking for something that's, uh, that's quite innovative. And the fourth one is something that, that you mentioned, it's called ideality. Ideality says that when the problem is there, the solution appears. When the problem's not there, since you don't need the solution, it doesn't really uh, influence anything, so it, it's not there. Um, an interesting example, I think, is uh, there, there's an issue when people start to gather in public areas when, let's say, there's a demonstration and a lot of people come. So usually, uh, the police, especially in New York City, they actually implemented this, uh, this Israeli uh, invention. Um, the NYPD, what they do is they sometimes have these very, very large uh, gatherings of people, and they want to keep them away from uh, the dignitary or whatever it is they're demonstrating against. And they had, they had a problem, is that the more people that came, even though they put up their police barriers uh, to try to keep them out, the more people that were actually showing up to that, the more policemen they would have to position in that area in order to prevent the crowds from toppling over the barriers uh, and making it almost uh, impossible to, to get to the person they're trying to protect. And of course, if you bring in more policemen, you're either spending more budget because you're paying more overtime or auxiliary policemen, uh, or you're bringing policemen away from other places in the city where it's necessary to have them. So it wasn't the best solution. And so they found a different solution, again, through uh, this Israeli patent, uh, and it looked like this. Their barriers, they changed the shape of the barriers. I don't know if you can see. Uh, from the glare, but the barriers aren't shaped like this anymore. They're shaped like L. This is the shape. It has kind of a stand here. And it looks like this. So when you get, when you get your demonstrators, and there are only a few demonstrators, it's not a very strong barrier. It's, very, it's quite flimsy uh, in its design. But the more people, the more demonstrators you get there, the stronger it gets, because the, the demonstrators are actually standing on the barrier, and they're making it sturdier. And the more weight that you have there, uh, the fewer policemen you'll actually need. So when you don't really have a problem, it doesn't have to be a strong barrier. When you have the problem, it has to be strong. And it's actually the people that are making it, uh, the demonstrators that are actually making it stronger. So this idea of ideality uh, is, has been found to contribute to the innovativeness uh, of ideas. Through additional research, we've identified 
that there are basically what's called in literature now the two sufficient conditions for an inventive solution. Sufficient conditions basically means that there can be solutions that are innovative that don't have these conditions appear there. But if you see these two conditions in your solution, across the board it will be considered an innovative one. So they're not necessary conditions. You can have solutions that are inventive without them, but if they're there, it will definitely be an inventive solution. The first one is called the closed world, the closed world condition or the closed world principle, which states that the only resources that are available for solving a problem are those that already exist in the problem world. It's very much connected with with the comments that, that we heard from uh, the back table about utilizing the resources that are there. Not developing anything new in the antenna, no new parts, no new anything to combat the problem, just using what's already there. And those things that are already there could be parts of the antenna and they could be things that are there in the environment that we're sure will be around in order to solve that. Um, in, in the academic literature it's just shown as uh, if this is the, the problem world and this is the solution world, that you have component A, B, C, D, or resource A, B, C, D in the problem world, and it's exactly identical to A, B, C, D. Now, you can have some, cha some slight changes in the resource itself, but you can't add any additional type of resources. And that's what the closed world says. You're never allowed to add anything that's completely external to the situation in order to solve the problem. That's the most basic tenet of systematic inventive thinking, and we'll see uh, how that demonstrates itself in other applications also that we'll talk about. <clears throat> One of the things that always helps me remember and keep, give me a visual, vis visual representation of the closed world principle is this part of uh, the Apollo 13 movie. I'll just show it to you. Hopefully the volume will, will prove to be uh, good enough. Gene? We have a situation brewing with the carbon dioxide. We had a CO2 filter problem on the lunar module. Five filters on the limb. Which were meant for two guys for a day and a half. So I told the doctor. They're already up to eight on the gauges. Anything over 15 and you get impaired judgment, blackouts, the beginnings of brain asphyxia. What about the scrubbers on the command module? They take square cartridges. The ones on the limb are round. <laughs> Tell me this isn't a government operation. It just isn't the contingency we've remotely looked at. Those CO2 levels are going to be getting toxic. Well, I suggest you gentlemen invent a way to put a square peg in a round hole. Rapidly. Okay, people, listen up. People upstairs, handed us this one, and we got to come through. We got to find a way to make this fit into the hole for this. Using nothing but that. Let's get it organized. Okay, okay, let's build a filter. Better get some coffee going too, someone. So, in this case, in Apollo 13, it was kind of obvious why they had to use the closed world solution because they were up in space. They don't really have additional resources uh, that they have access to, so they have to solve the, the problem with closed, world, cl with closed world resources. But us, down here on Earth, uh, usually our tendency is to try to find other resources to solve our problem, to try to solve our problem. Because if the problem appears with the resources we have, then probably those that are already there, the assumption is they're not going to be able to help us solve it. So what we need, what we need to do is look outside of what resources we have today in order to solve the problem. What the closed worlds principle does is it actually forces you to say that you're not allowed to look outside. And it artificially puts this constraint on your thinking process to make sure that first you try to identify the inventive solutions and then if you can't find anything, you can go and try to invent a solution that's, that uses completely different resources or different technologies or changes the, changes the paradigm completely. So that's the first of, the, uh, of these two sufficient conditions that we were talking about. And obviously if we, if we connect it back to our innovation sweet spot and we say that all you're allowed to use when you're solving problems are resources that were available to you all along in the problem situation, that principle plays a very strong role in making sure that you don't get too far. Making sure that you don't identify solutions that are so out there that you wouldn't even know what to do with them, that are so wacky that implementation seems light years away. So this 
closed world principle is actually pushing the innovator uh, to make sure that they don't get too far out. For the fat, for the skinny, for the tall, for the short, for those that laugh, for the nearsighted, for those who cry, for the optimistic, for the pessimistic, for those who have it all, for those who have nothing, for the open, for the players, for the closed, for the families, for the anxious, for kings, for magicians, for the committed, for castaways, for the rockers, for those that go, for those who ride the train, for the well-mannered, for those who suffer, for bikers, for the ones who are there, for the ones who work, for the ones who are here, for the romantics, for those who love you, for those who love you not, for those who love you a little, for those who love you a lot, for the tanned, for nudists, for the superstitious, for the originals, for jugglers, for the calculating, for the bald, for sportsmen, for those who read, for those who write, for astronauts, for twins, for the different, for clowns, for those who live alone, for those who live together, for the undecided, for kissers, for the first, for the last, for men, for the cautious, for her, for musicians, for the transparent, for the strong, for the ones who excel, for the ones who participate, for the ones who add, for the ones who won't be silent, for us, for everyone. You can think of probably million Coca-Cola commercials that use lots of uh, sports stars and pyrotechnics and lots of non-external -exter world sort of elements to try to make it interesting. But this won probably the most awards of any of the Coca-Cola commercials and it's probably the most powerful image, uh, brand image commercial that they ever came out with by just using a very simple element as part of their closed world, it's their packaging and they found different ways to communicate what they're all about through just that packaging, not through the pyrotechnics and the superstars that they had to pay billions to uh, in order to make sure that it happened. So very low production, using your, using your closed world uh, uh, resources in order to uh, make sure that you come out with the most powerful communication in this case, or the most powerful innovation, or the most powerful solution, whatever it is you're aiming to do, always remember to use the closed world, and that you're richer than you really think you are, that you really have a lot more to utilize with what you have already than you had originally assumed. So hopefully that that's uh, the message you take away from today. The second uh, sufficient condition is, the second condition is called the qualitative change condition, that it tells us that instead of looking to solve problems by balancing out the elements of the problem, what we look to do is completely change the relationship between the, between the elements. So we keep the exact same resources that we had all along, but we change how they interact with each other. And what do we mean? Let's say that this was uh, how we might graph out uh, the problem that we started with. We had the amount of ice, which is our worsening factor. It has a negative effect on the probability of collapse. So the more ice there is, the more probable that the antenna will collapse. We agree that that's how we would chart out our problem uh, in this original situation. So the way we would normally try to approach that is to try to change the slope in some way so that the problem isn't as acute, so it doesn't happen as often, and we optimize certain engineering solutions to make sure that it's less of a problem. Not that it's no problem at all, but it's less of a problem and percentages say that it will happen so infrequently that it shouldn't really bother us. <clears throat> the qualitative change tells us that instead of just changing the slope, what we have to do is actually completely reimagine the relationship between these components. We have to tell ourselves that really in the, in the inventive solution, not only is the amount of ice not going to have a severe negative effect on the strength or the probability of collapse uh, of the antenna, but it will actually have a positive effect. It tells us to flip our thinking uh, on its head. And what we need to do is imagine, could there be a situation where the more ice there is or the more snow there is, the stronger or the less probable that the, that the antenna will collapse. Conversely, or additionally, the qualitative change doesn't say that you necessarily have to turn it on its head, but it says that you at least have to neutralize it so that the worsening factor isn't worsening anymore. It's completely neutralized and it has no influence whatsoever on whether or not uh, the, the uh, antenna will collapse in this case. So the snow won't have any effect. So in the qualitative change, you're not allowed to look for optimizations. You either have to completely sever the ties of the relationship or turn them on, its head, on their head. 
those are the two sufficient conditions for inventive solutions. So if you have the closed world condition and all you're using are the existing resources, but you find a way to make the relationships between, uh, between the problem factors very different from what they are at the current state, at the current situation during the problem, then you've been able to also accomplish the qualitative change. And that's what makes sure that we're in the, uh, we're in the sweet spot. So the qualitative change makes sure that you're doing something substantially different with the resources that you have at hand. So it's pushing you out. And the closed world is telling you only with the resources that you have at hand. So it's making sure you don't get too far away. What you started going through is the beginning of the process that we implement uh, at SIT when we want to develop new products or come out with completely new value uh, to consumers. And uh, this process starts at kind of the first stage where I ask you to identify a product that you both like. And we call this the existing situation. You have some sort of existing situation. In this case, it was a product, but it could be a strategy, it could be uh, a business model. It could be anything that you have in your organization. It's an existing situation which you can identify and define uh, and give it its, its closed world, identify its closed world. Now, what I asked you to do to that existing situation was to ruin it. And what ruining it does is actually manipulate, make some sort of change to this existing situation. Now, I'll tell you, at SIT, there's no such tool called ruining something. We find that it's not a very productive tool. Sometimes it can throw you in other directions, but ruining in and of itself uh, has been suggested as a creativity tool and has been shown not to be an extremely efficient way to generate true innovation. So there is a manipulation stage, and we'll come to learn about a few of the different manipulations that we found actually work. Uh, but just for the purpose of our exercise, we went through a very quick process of just ruining because it's the fastest and easiest thing to do to demonstrate the process. Once you've ruined it, you arrive at what we call a virtual situation. You don't have to try to read the, the really thin green writing I have on this flip chart because I'll pull it up onto the screen in just a minute. Just We want to develop the flow. The virtual situation just means that it's different from what you started from. So you started from something, you changed it, and now you have a different situation. So now describe and try to visualize what your new situation is. What is it? In this case, it was a product, of course. And then I asked you to identify markets, people who are willing to buy it, um, as John mentioned, um, <clears throat> and the reasons for them to buy it. So the people that will buy it and the benefits that they will receive for buying it. So these are kind of the marketing and commercialization questions. Who's going to pay you money for it, and why will they? What are they going to get out of it? Now, I stop the questions here, but the process continues two more stages. The next one is, can I make it? It's a very important question. We've manipulated our existing situation. We've done something different to it. It doesn't necessarily mean that, we're as, that we as an organization can do it. We just thought about doing it, but can we really do it? What are the challenges that we're going to face along the way of actually making that new product once I've identified the, the markets and the benefits or whatever? And usually, instead of being a yes or no answer, can I make it or can I not make it, usually you don't have that kind of answer. You just come up with a series of problems or challenges that will stand in the way of being able to do it. You have the final stage that's called adaptations. And adaptations mean, let's think of solutions to overcome the challenges we identified without ruining the benefits we identified. And that's where a lot of times you'll find that the problem solving that we learned earlier before the break, you'll find yourself applying a lot of problem solving principles here of how do we solve the challenges that we've identified in order to retain the benefits. And the output of this process is what we call an idea. If you've succeeded in going through this entire process and finding value and finding the challenges and potential directions of how to overcome them, then you can write down that thing as an idea, a new product idea, a business model idea, a strategy idea, whatever it is we're aiming to accomplish through this process. So this is the full flow, what you went through 
is just until this part. <coughs> so now I'll pull it up. I know that Omri has distributed to you uh, the cards. Now, we call this process function follows form. Function follows form. Now, some of you out there are in construction industry. And we know out of the construction industry was built the, uh, the school of thought of Bauhaus, which is used throughout design, for those of you in design, uh, which is the primary approach uh, today to developing new products or new buildings or new anything, uh, which says first identify what you want out of this thing and then build the form. Build what it looks like to accomplish that function. So Bauhaus really talks about form following function. But in innovation, what SAT expects you to do is to do the opposite. It tells you, first develop these virtual products, these new potential forms, what it might look like, how you might be able to leverage your existing situation, your existing resources to make changes. And then ask yourself the question, if I make this change, who might be willing to buy it? What might, why might they want to buy it? Can we do this, uh, et cetera? So now, take another two minutes with the same partner that you used to reflect on the process before I showed you function follows form, and think about some issues, comments, advantages, disadvantages, things that come to mind when you see that this is actually the process that I'm expecting you to use when you want to go about innovating. Okay? So some comments about the benefits, disadvantages, etc., thoughts that you have about this process. I'll take it one step further. In your existing situation, you have to know your product really well, but you also have to know your market really well because embedded in your product is a lot of market knowledge. That's why it's a successful product in the market. That's why you're not approaching it from problem solving. It doesn't have a problem. You have a very successful product, and probably captured in there is a lot of market, uh, market knowledge. So when you're considering using function follows form, it really forces you to have an intimate understanding of your business, not just of your product, but of your market and how it is that you go to market with that product and why it's a success. Form will usually uh, follow function specifically because built in there has to be an adaptation stage. So adaptations are actually creating the new form based on the functions you identified in, in the market. So yes, there is a form follows function element of the process. It's just not the starting point. And what's important here is where you're starting to get your, your ideas for, for new innovations. Because if we started from the function, then we'd be in the near area. We'd be trying to make things better or different or smaller. And that's really what's trying to hit that. What's, what's the function follows form is actually helping us. If you think of the closed world pushing us in, it's actually the function follows form as a starting point that's pushing us out, making sure we don't stay in too far. Because we're not starting from the function, we're starting from the form, but because of the iterations, we're including all these elements at different stages. What's really important with function follows form is that you have a starting point, and your starting point is what you have today. It's basically telling you how to implement the closed world principle in a new product development or new strategy development or business model development or some other type of model when you're not looking to just solve a problem. It's telling you, closed world is your starting point. That's your existing situation. Start from there. Then figure out what you're going to do, how you're going to do it differently, and what options that opens up. The other element that's really important here is, is what we call the filters. And we have two filters. We have a marketing filter, and we have a feasibility filter. Built into the process of function follows form, we have to have these two filters. And to tell you the truth, when we first developed uh, this method, we used to say that there are two filters, and they look like this. You have your virtual situation, your virtual product, and you have your market filter and your feasibility filter. And you want to investigate which one. Uh, you want to make sure that both of them, uh, both of them, sorry, that the idea can pass through both of them before continuing on. And we consider that a parallel process. <clears throat> But as we've gotten more experience using this method uh, across industries, we've realized that it's not a parallel process, that the market filter comes before the feasibility filter. Any thoughts on why we came to that conclusion? Yeah. We have, we have a facilitator that was a well-known physicist uh, in his area, and he says, as long as it's not against the laws of physics, anything's possible. 
You just have to know how much effort you're going to put into making it possible. And so we have to first assess what are the market possibilities. If there's little market possibility, even if we can do it, maybe it's not worthwhile. If there's great market possibility, even if it's really challenging, let's put in the effort to try to figure out how to do it. So first, let's go through the market filter. It doesn't say that the feasibility filter isn't, as, isn't important. It's important, but first assess what's the size of the prize. Then we can see how much effort we're going to put in to overcoming the challenges. And that's something that we've learned along the way. And it's important to keep in mind that both filters are essential. Just put them in the right order. Uh, identify what are the benefits are before you identify the challenges. There's another interesting reason in that, especially in Western society, there's a mental, a psychological tendency to first look for what's problematic about an idea and then what's good about the idea. And because we want to avoid judging the idea too early, just like brainstorming tells you to do, you don't want to suspend judgment, you just want to suspend judgment till the right time. So first identify what are the benefits, then look at what are, what are, the, uh, what are the challenges instead of the other way around, which can really uh, harm uh, an innovation process. So we want to get to this uh, beginning of understanding one of these tools that we're supposed to use during the manipulation process. And it's a thinking tool. <clears throat> and I see that we, we have some uh, trees uh, presentations again in the afternoon. Uh, and we have uh, some people here that have been exposed to or learned in depth trees that have talked with me during the break and in the morning. Um, one of the things that SAT has used out of trees has, has actually adopted from trees is this concept that innovative solutions and innovative products share commonalities. That usually when we think about innovation, we usually think about what's different about this thing. How is it different from other things that we're doing? Or how is it different from other things that we're familiar with? What trees and what SAT also does is it tries to look at assuming that all these things that we have in front of us are innovative things, what's in common between them? Can we identify what is unique about them that's not unique about all these other things that aren't successful or that aren't innovative, what differentiates them from the rest of the crowd? So when I pull up the slide and say, what do these items have in common? I'm showing you four different consumer goods in this case, which you might be familiar, I'll just mention what they are, that have something in common with each other. They're all successful products in the market and they all have something in common with each other that made them really successful and innovative. We have our uh, stationary exercise bike, uh, a package of powdered soup, um, a baby seat, a baby chair that you can hook onto a table, and contact lenses. Okay? So take a minute to just think about what these four items that come from very different industries, what do they have, what do these successful products have in common with each other that perhaps unsuccessful products don't have? Okay, so, so I think, I think what's, what's interesting here is that um, it's a combination of, of exactly what you said is what we're looking for here, is that in each of these cases you can identify what the previous generation product was, and in order to evolve to the next generation, something was taken away, not only something, but as you mentioned, the most essential thing probably of this product was taken away. Uh, when we work with food companies, they say the soup was taken out of the soup. When you take away the water, who can imagine soup without water? Uh, it's ridiculous. Um, you took away the legs of the chair. The whole point of a chair is to keep you at a certain height, and all of, all of a sudden you take away the, the, the legs whose function is to do that. Um, you can imagine the guy from Schwinn who walked into his, uh, his boss's uh, office and said, I have a great idea for our next generation bike. It doesn't have wheels. You can't go anywhere. And obviously, as you mentioned, it didn't retain the benefit, it actually found a completely different benefit in this case. They never thought of bikes as exercise vehicles. They always thought of bi bikes as transportation vehicles and the removing of the wheels gave them a completely new market to explore. Uh, and of course the contact lenses removed the frames from, uh, from the spectacles. So <clears throat> this is something that's very interesting. You're removing the most essential part and we call this tool subtraction. Subtraction says remove the most essential component or remove essential components from the product and then you have your virtual product and understand what you have. What could be the benefits of that kind of thing? 
If you think back to our uh, ruin the product exercise, a lot of you in actually ruining the product did subtraction. Because one of the interesting things about subtraction is that a lot of times it's considered a ruining process. And that's oftentimes why it's so difficult to imagine why I would go ahead and subtract something. What do you mean now? You want me to ruin it? A lot of times you, you get that question, why do you want me to take away something because you want me to ruin it? Because it's very much perceived as if you take something away, you're ruining it. If you add something, it's improving it. Because now you have more features and more stuff. If you have more stuff, then it's probably good. <clears throat> so let's understand how the subtraction fits into function follows form. Um, we'll take an example, uh, perhaps a, a television set. We'll take a television set. And what's our first, what's our first step? in working with the television set. What do, we, what do we do according to function follows form? We identify the existing situation, right? Existing situation is our list of resources or components. So what are the components of our television set? Screen. Screen. Sorry? Controls. Controls. Perhaps remote. Sometimes they're remote, sometimes they're both. Audio, you have some sort of speakers. Electricity, there's a power source. It's a housing. Housing, I think it's the same thing. Housing, case, box, something that's holding all the stuff together. Stuff, sorry. So, it's a good question. If we were Sony that's trying to innovate it, probably not, because it's not something that we're making. It all depends on what your starting point is. If you're a, uh, an office design person, then that's part of your resources, and you can subtract the mounting of them. So it all depends on that. Let's assume we're Sony for the, for the purpose of this exercise. Um, there's some sort of electronics, because it's receiving some sort of signal, so there's a receiver and other things. And of course, if we were Sony, we'd have a much longer list than what we have right now. Now, subtraction, of course, that's our existing situation. We just did it. Subtraction says, look at your existing situation, identify what's most essential, subtract that first, and then, again, systematically, like we did in problem solving, subtract one at a time and see what we can get out of this uh, process. There's another company that we were working with in, in the uh, um, detergent industry. Anyone work in cleansing fluids or cleaners or whatever? Yes. Um, if you think about a detergent, let's say a laundry detergent, basically it's very basic chemistry. And if you think about the components, you're, you once again run into uh, very few components in your detergent. You have some sort of active ingredient. You, because the active ingredient usually stinks pretty bad, uh, you put in some sort of perfume because you don't want your clothing to stink. Because you have those two, which usually which don't necessarily blend very well together, you have some sort of binder. If it's liquid, you have water. If it's powder, you don't. And you have a package. So those are pretty much your components. And now you're told, now I have to do subtraction. What's your most essential component in your detergent? The active ingredient. So now let's take away the active ingredient. Your detergent maker, now you have a detergent without an active ingredient. But it has, let's, let's define our virtual product right, it has perfume, binder, and package. You're selling some sort of perfume with binder and a package as a detergent, but it doesn't clean. Okay? Now, what are your markets? What are your benefits? I see that you're smiling, so it's ridiculous enough that we want to explore. <laughs> it smells good. It smells good. It'll clean things that aren't dirty. That's great. Now, when somebody said that in the room, they said, it'll clean things that aren't dirty. Again, one of the market research pe per people pipes up and says, you know what? We've been getting this feedback, or we've been observing more appropriately, through our empathic design, that a lot of people throw their clothes in the laundry, not because they're soiled, 
but because they're not fresh anymore. You wore them once, so your shirt's not dirty, but you put it on your chair or you hang it in your closet or whatever, you know that you've worn it once. And then a few days later, you come back and you say, no, I'm not going to wear that. I already wore it. And you throw it in the hamper. Does that ever happen to you? It happens most of the time. Most clothing doesn't really need to have active ingredient in it. It just needs to be able to go through the process. Now, the active ingredient is really bad on your clothing. It's a really tough uh, chemical that wears down the clothing. It's the, most, it's the biggest reason for the typical wear down of clothing, except for kids who abuse their clothing. But if you think about it, you've just identified that you can sell a detergent that you use for your non-soiled clothing. This is the detergent that you use on a regular basis when you don't have really dirty clothes. And what they noticed, because in the room we also had the regulatory people, regulatory people said, well, you can't call that a detergent. It's against, the, it's against the law to call that a detergent. So what they called it instead was a laundry refresher. And they started marketing this as a laundry refresher. And you'll see that there are some in the market today. Uh, Febreze is the, is the, is the best well-known of these versions. Um, that is basically just perfume. It has a little bit of active ingredient because we do want it to clean just a little bit, get the sweat off or whatever is, is making it not, uh, not fresh. It has a package and it has the, the binder to, to do that. And it's really, the, the marketing promise is it doesn't wear down your clothes. Uh, and this is for your non-soiled clothing. And it really just a completely new line, a new, a new category of detergents that this company was able to open up uh, because of this ridiculous subtraction exercise of taking away the most essential piece, most essential component of something that has almost no components. This is where the entire idea of the discipline really comes in extremely strong. We, we were working with, uh, with a company that makes these. Uh, sanding disks and grinding disks. Ever use them? Yeah? So this is what they make. And if we wanted to identify the components of this, what would you think the components are? Paper. paper. We have a paper backing. Sand or some sort of abrasive. Adhesive. Adhesive that keeps the abrasive on the paper. And if we're really desperate, we can call a hole a component uh, because we're running out of things. Um, and you can say that the whole thing, the disk itself, is a component. It looks like one piece, so maybe that's a component. So again, in a very structured way, what we, what we would do is we want to subtract each of these components one at a time. One of the things that we did in this process was to say, let's say we subtract the disk. Subtract the disk. We have the hole, but let's subtract the disk. Right? Ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Why is it ridiculous? Because you have nothing. But what does function follows form tell you to do? It's a very disciplined process. But once we've imagined the virtual product of subtracting the disk, are we allowed to say the challenges? No. First, what are the benefits? What if we had a grinding wheel? We'll call it what we have. A grinding wheel with nothing. It's a grinding wheel with nothing. What would be good about a grinding wheel with nothing? Never wear out. It would never wear out. It would last infinitely, forever. What else? It's lightweight. Inexpensive. Inexpensive to manufacture, definitely. What else? You can sand any shape. It doesn't have to be round, and you can get the corners or whatever you're looking for. Good. Sorry? It's green. Yeah, it's definitely sustainable. It won't tear. Yeah, it won't, it won't break down. It will last forever because of the friction, and it won't tear. There's no friction. It won't tear, etc. And then somebody said, well, it will be completely transparent. You know, you get into that kind of mindset. Oh, that's ridiculous. I'll just throw out anything. It'll be tra completely transparent. And then in the room, somebody said, from, from the commercial side of the business, said, you know what? One of the complaints that we've been getting from the usual grinding wheels is that when you want, let's say you're sanding a very large surface, you put it down, you start sanding or you start grinding, it's smooth, and then you move on to the next area. After you've hit a certain point, you have to check to make sure that you've, you've smoothed it out exactly the same as the other part, because if you smooth it out too much, then the other part you have to go back and redo, and if you smooth it out too little, you have to put down exactly the right place in order to regrind there so that you're not, so that you're not regrinding things that you've already smoothed out. <coughs> so if we could make 
a transparent grinding wheel that would last longer because it has less friction or whatever, that would be a really interesting idea. This isn't something that we would normally consider because we don't think that we subtract the entire thing. And then, once we identified that, we have the benefits. We now know what the benefits are of this grinding wheel. Now we have the challenges. Now we say, but we can't sell nothing. Now we can get to that, but what are you selling? And in the adaptation stage, we can say, well, we're still selling a grinding wheel, but we're making sure that all these benefits exist. And that's what the process actually happened there. And they came out with this grinding wheel that was a slightly different shape, which had holes and these lines coming out of it. And if you think about it, when you put it on a drill bit or whatever machine that's used to, to spin it, uh, think about a propeller on an airplane when it spins really fast. <clears throat> it's completely transparent. And because a lot of the sawdust or the pieces of metal, the parts of it are coming out, there's a lot less friction that's, that's blocking it. So they actually came out with a really interesting, innovative grinding disc uh, that did pretty well in the market from subtracting from a very strange thing. How can I subtract from this? So this is, this is of course, a level. It's sometimes called the bubble level or spirit level, as opposed to what's used a lot of times today as a laser level. And there's a company, a very small company, in fact, um, that what they do, that now they make laser levels, but when they called us in, they said, listen, we make spirit levels. We don't have the, the uh, capital right now to invest in the new technology that's coming out of laser levels. So in order to combat that, we're going to want, we want to be the innovation company on spirit levels, on bubble levels. Now, do you know when the, the bubble level was invented? The spare level was invented? Long ago. Long ago, that's right. <laughs> the first documented case was with the Egyptians building the pyramids. So it's at least 3,000 years, just over 3,000 years at least. Um, and there's been absolutely no innovation since then. It looks exactly the same. It's highly functional. It works great. <clears throat> now, they say what we want to do is we want to be the innovation company for, for spirit levels. But nobody's innovated this for 3,000 years. Why do you think that you can? <clears throat> so we started applying a different tool that's called multiplication. Multiplication, again, tells you your existing situation is your components. What are your components here? You have your vial with a bubble inside, your sheathing, your kind of casing, and you sometimes have handles on the side. And that's pretty much <clears throat> what your bubble level is made of. So in multiplication, you take each one of those things and you add more copies of it. One copy, two copies, three copies. It's still closed world because you're not adding new things, you're just adding more copies of the same thing. But the interesting thing is that with multiplication, you have to make some sort of change to the copies. Some sort of change to the copies. So they have to be different one from the other in some way. Uh, if you think about the example of uh, the Gillette razor, uh, their first innovation, their, um, I, th I think they even called it maybe the, the double before they went into all the mock whatever. Um, their innovation was that they added an extra blade to the level, right? Uh, to, the, to the razor. They had an extra blade. But that's not very innovative to just add more of something, as you saw in subtraction. That's what we usually do. But what they did, or at least they communicated, is that one blade, you remember this? One blade lifts and the other one cuts. And the result is a closer shave. So it's not just a, uh, a sharper blade. It's two blades at, at different angles to have the result, the benefit of a closer shave. So that's what multiplication basically means. You add another razor, another blade, but it's different. It's at a different angle. And here, they did the same thing. They added more bubbles, more vials. And the variable that we chose, we went through several variables. We could have done it in color. We could have done it with position on the, on, the, on the shaft. And we did it with all these things. One of the things they said was the angle. So now you have a level that measures 0 degree slope, 1 degree, and 2 degrees. Who might want to buy this? Now this is your virtual product. Who might want this? What are the benefits? What are the markets? Drain water from a deck. Drain water from a deck, from a roof, in a bathtub. Uh, a, a large facility that has a lot of piping and you have to make sure that you have angles that are as minimal as possible for the drainage so that it doesn't take up too much room. All these things uh, it would be really good for. But you had all these needs beforehand. So what did people do before that? 
Hmm? Yeah. So some of them would actually shim it. They would cut off part of it. But then you couldn't use it as a regular level. You had to use it only for that. Uh, some would, have, would actually bang nails into it. That they would be able, and then they'd have an approximate slope. They didn't know exactly what the slope is, but they knew it wasn't straight. Some used the, the cigarette carton trick, where you put a cigarette carton on the bottom and then you tape it. So you, you don't know what the slope is, but it's pretty much standard, whatever you're doing, because the cigarette carton is the, right, the standard size. So people were finding their own ways to accomplish this. But only through multiplication, they finally came out with uh, this product, um, which they have as, as, uh, as, as a sloped level. Uh, they call it a top grade, as a gradient level uh, that was pretty successful in the market um, <clears throat> for that. And you can pass it around if anyone's interested in looking at it. And, and as we were doing multiplication, again, because it's a systematic process, we, had, we understood what are some other variables. Let's say we multiplied it, and we came out with uh, another copy. But this copy is a virtual copy. It's not real. It's just a reflection of the original. So the additional copy here was a mirror that's put at 45 degree angle to reflect this, to reflect this bubble, this vial. What might you use this for? Why is it good that you can see that this is straight? I don't, like, I don't want to ruin the walls in this great uh, venue, but a lot of times when you're putting up drywall, or painting a wall or something, and you want to make sure that it's still parallel, uh, that it's parallel to the, to the, to the ground, uh, you put it up, and you look from the side to see if your bubble's in the middle to see whether it's straight, your drywall is straight. There's this thing that's called uh, uh, painter's cheek, and they put up their, their cheek to the wall, and they look at it from the side. Uh, so that's only just one minor problem. The real problem is you can't get a great angle, and sometimes you're off by, by a little and the wall's not straight in the end. So basically what it tells you that you can do now is instead of that, instead of looking from the side, you can look at it head on and see where the bubble is. So because it's reflecting this one, you can actually see head on whether it's, uh, whether it's straight. And, um, they called this the shark because it really looked nice and like a shark and smooth, but uh, it, was a, it was an interesting way to evolve, uh, evolve levels. And this company, they actually uh, decided that their goal, actually their survival strategy, is going to be against these new technologies, against these large Stanley companies, that they're going to come out with uh, that 20% of their annual revenue from now forward has to come from products that are less than one year old. And in the last eight years, they've succeeded in averaging more than 30% of their revenue of products more than, uh, less than one year old. And it's really interesting, once you have a very systematic process and you can multiply the same component over and over and over again and come out with so many different ideas, as several of you mentioned before with the subtraction uh, and the ruining the product and, and all these other things, you can come out with almost an infinite number of ideas by applying these very kind of simple operators, the multiplications, the subtractions. And if you do it very systematically, um, you can come out with hundreds uh, of products. And the CEO of the company says that um, one of the things that he, can, that he can testify to is that he wasn't always first to market with all of the innovations, but he was never ever surprised by something that made it to market because it was always on their list. If you go systematically, you can really see what the complete comprehensive evolution of your product is going to be for several generations. And then your strategy isn't what am I going to do next, but how do I decide? What's next? Uh, and just the last tool, we only have two minutes, so I'll just introduce the third out of the five tools. It's called division. And division means that you take, again, your closed world, your components, but instead of subtracting them and taking them away or making additional copies, you just move them to somewhere else. So you take a component, like here, let's take the, the bubble again, the vial again. And instead of putting it inside the vial, you put it on the front, uh, inside the level, inside the casing, you put it on the front. And that gives you the degrees of freedom to start moving it around. And if you're able to do that, what, cut, what could this level be good for? Hanging pictures, hanging pictures, hanging shelves, hanging anything where you don't know uh, exactly where you have to put the two, uh, the two nails or, or your hinges. 
And what they did in their adaptations was really interesting. They actually put the zero in the middle rather than a regular ruler, and then it's one centimeter from, from the zero, two centimeters, and then you can put them in exactly the right place, uh, that they're both 17 centimeters from, from the middle. And because you always know where you want the middle of your shelf to be, or the middle of your picture to be. You never know where you have to put the, the nails in order to make sure that that happens. So now you can actually make sure that your shelf is going to be level because your bubbles are exactly at those places, the right places. And you did this by just taking the, taking the vials out and putting them on the front and being able to move them around a bit. Um, and the final example of division that I just wanted to show you was instead of this time using the vial, they went to a different component and they said it was the entire product. It's the shaft. Let's say we divided the shaft and <clears throat> instead of having a flat one, we're able to click it into 15 degree uh, spaces. So by doing so, what are the advantages? Who might want to buy this? Who might want something that you can fold and actually click into whatever you want? I'll give you, I'll give you a hint. It's called the post right. For fences, some people even planting trees, they don't want their tree to grow crooked. Or you, you put a, a fence or a pole or some sort of structural uh, pillar in the middle of your building, you want to make sure that it's straight. So you want to go around the pillar to make sure that it's straight in, in lots of different directions. And so they were able to do this. There was actually on the market a, a level that was 90 degrees, but nobody was buying it because it couldn't fit into a toolbox. It didn't fit anywhere. Um, so they actually, when they came up with this concept of division of making it clickable into 15 degree angles, they actually made it the right size so that it can fit into any pocket. This, these pockets are closed, so uh, you, can, you can test it on yourself. It fits into any pocket uh, and definitely into, into toolboxes. So it's very portable and it accomplishes all the things that, uh, that a normal level would do. So, so if this is the, the process and this is uh, subtraction, you'll notice that some of the ideas that came up were very different from each other. You can actually classify them into two or, or more categories of ideas. And I just wanted to demonstrate that. If our starting point is an existing process, an existing product in this case, our typical inclination would be to add something, right? Whenever we want to make, create more value, we add something to it. What we tell you to do by doing the subtraction tool is actually to not add something. Let's block that path and remove something. Remove something that's, in fact, essential. Now, when we remove something that's essential, you'll hear that the first few ideas that normally come up are replaced with something. Maybe we have other screens that are available to us. And let's identify all those other screens that are, that are around. So we took away our screen, but we didn't really take away the function together with it. We're still applying that function. That's what our tendency would normally be to do when going through this psychological process. And therefore, we tell ourselves, don't do that. First, let's identify all the options of a screenless television and you can't see. Look at all the possibilities that we found. We found for the hard of hearing and for the drivers and for the sports fans and for the, the blind and for others that we'd be able to identify. Now, once we've identified that, we can go back to our replace with something. It's interesting that you first mentioned replace with screens that are available. Usually the tendency would be replace with something externally. Um, we had somebody say maybe we'll make glasses or goggles or something specifically for that so that the new person can see. If you didn't learn about closed world earlier today, uh, usually those are the kinds of ideas that come up. Let's first make something dedicated to this new product. And then we'll see what can we use in the closed world in order to accomplish that screen. So this process that we tell you to go through, the existing product, instead of adding go remove something, instead of replacing what you, instead of replacing the component, you figure out the as is benefits. Then replace with something, but first close world something, and then uh, the external something, the completely new technology something, we call that the path of most resistance. The path of most resistance. <clears throat> and it's very important as an innovation process to be aware that when we want to innovate, we want to pay attention to what would we normally do, and now let's do the opposite. Not because what we normally do isn't good, just because it will deflect our attention, it will divert our attention from areas 
that are perhaps very fruitful that we normally wouldn't think of. So let's force ourselves to go to those places where we wouldn't normally explore before we go to the easier places, to the places that we would normally think about. It usually also leads to more differentiated products because our competitors are probably going the easier route, the path of least resistance when they're thinking of new products. Uh, and we have the benefit of now being aware of exploring completely different new ground. Uh, one of the things that uh, helps me remember this path of most resistance principle that we should always look for the way, be, I, be aware of how we normally think and try to force ourselves to think in the opposite way is, uh, let's see, is this, uh, there's a Seinfeld episode uh, where you see George who's frustrated with his life. <laughs> Uh, George, you know that woman just looked at you. So what? What am I supposed to do? Go talk to her. Elaine, bald men with no jobs and no money who live with their parents <laughs> don't approach strange women. Well, here's your chance to try the opposite. Instead of tuna salad and being intimidated by women, chicken salad and going right up to them. Yeah, I should do the opposite. I should. If every instinct you have is wrong, then the opposite would have to be right. Yes. I will do the opposite. I used to sit here and do nothing and regret it for the rest of the day. So now I will do the opposite and I will do something. Excuse me. Uh, I couldn't help but notice that you were looking in my direction. <laughs> oh, yes, I was. You just ordered the same exact lunch as me. <laughs> my name is George. I'm unemployed and I live with my parents. I'm Victoria. Hi. <laughs> so, so do the opposite when you want to innovate. <laughs> okay. Um, so we learned a little about function follows form and how it helps us, just like qualitative change when it comes to uh, problem solving, function follows form makes sure that we don't stay too close in because a lot of times we have to do a manipulation without understanding why. Why are you doing subtraction? Why did you just do subtraction to the television set? Because I told you to. Why did I tell you to? Because it was identified as a commonality between successful products in the past or between successful solutions and strategies. So if we know that subtraction is at the core, at the DNA of successful innovations or the way that we should, uh, or successes or innovations, if we know that it's there, it means that we should try to make sure that when we want to innovate, let's subtract something from our product. Not because we thought that it might make sense, just because the fact is, empirically, it works. It works a lot of time. So, by applying the subtraction tool and applying it properly through the path of most resistance, it forces us to do things, it forces us to push away from what we normally do. Actually, we're kind of ruining it because that's what subtraction is in a lot of our minds. We're ruining something, we're pushing away from where we are today beyond the er ideas, behind, beyond just make it better or, or worse or, or better, smaller, faster, uh, cheaper, whatever. The fact that we have to do it mechanically only because the method tells me to do it and tells me very specifically to subtract it, that's why I'm doing it and that's how it helps me push out.